Go ahead. Yeah, we'll be ready in about 30 seconds. Zero nine or stand Oakland Center 134.37. Stand Oakland, that's 846. It's ready to split off. Uh, Vehicle, and again, that goes back to uh, Neil Armstrong's description of the vehicle. Our next panel member is Wayne Ottinger. In 1960. He joined the Flight Research Center as the X-15 Propulsion Flight Operations Engineer and became the LLRV Project Engineer and later the Bell Aerosystems Plant Representative for the design and build in 1963 and the flight operations at, uh, until 1966. He then became the Technical Director for Bell Aerosystems on the LLTV, the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, during the early testing at Ellington Field starting in 1967 through late 1968. So, Wayne, would you join us? And Wayne is also a co-author of Unconventional, Contrary, and Ugly, the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle. And that's, again, a NASA history monograph. That's available online if you haven't seen it. A question for Wayne. Uh, from, uh, from Neil's presentation, we could see that there were a lot of competing ideas going out there going on out there for what was necessary for the Apollo program and, uh, and who should build what kind of a tool to help prepare. How did the LLRV survive uh, the competitive fight for funding and priority in astronaut training for the lunar landings? Well, it began, I think, when I was at Bell at the, during the design build phase. Uh, Bell had lost some contracts, and since ours was a cost-plus contract, um, our monies were dependent on their overhead rate and so forth, which was rising. And Paul Bickle was intent on not going back and asking for more money. And so I became uh, the team leader at the Bell plant to work with them and decide what could we do not to exceed the ceiling on the that we had they had originally built, bid on. And so as a result, we built the structure, did the components and the necessary fault tests on the components. But when we brought it out, we didn't have any wiring on it. We had no rocket or jet plumbing on it. We're gonna do that all out here in our shop. We saved a lot of money. Uh, without the help, though, of a lot of the Bell people, I brought about 20 Bell people out, uh, TDY. Some of them stayed over a year. Uh, but Bert Adams comes to mind, who maintained our drawings. But, uh, yeah, we arrived in April with both vehicles coming in semi-truck and disassembled. And in, from April till October, end of October, however many months that is, pretty short compared to today's uh, bureaucrats, <laughs> uh, we did the installation of all the wiring, the plumbing, set up all the system tests, had to make some structural modifications because as we did, I can remember having to beef up the mainframe so forth and so on, but, and we also tried to avoid any tether tests. So we made closed loop hot firing tests on two different innovative fixtures and got in the air safely on October 30th, 1964. And uh, we did limit cycle in yaw on that first flight <laughs> and Cal Jarvis and I were talking the other day. He said, well, I thought we did limit cycle on all three, but as Neil's tape shows, I think it was a second or third flight that we had a uh, limit cycle on all three. But, in backup. Uh, in backup. In backup, okay. Anyway, uh, 
fact, the funding and competitions, we had the MIT black box people, and they don't need uh, astronauts controlling the landing. <laughs> Thank goodness with Neil and, and others, they fought hard, but it still was a funding problem all the way through and late on getting started. And, and they wanted to train down at the Cape just the day before launch. We could never touch that. We had uh, such a short, uh, you know, due to some accidents and so forth, our availability of flight training time was very critical. Neil only had, I think, seven or eight flights one month before he launched in the LLTV, which was upgraded for the highest quality simulator. He had had some flights in the LLRV earlier before he had, we had lost it down there. Anyway, we'll go on. Thank you. Can I add a quickie about Ray and Frosty, our inspector, Leroy Frost? Uh, we were all back in the Bell plant during the final days of getting ready to ship it out here. And Ray had just gotten married before he came back uh, to Buffalo or Niagara Falls, and so we had a teletype system, and Frosty and I set up a, uh, an extension of his TDY to stay another three months, and this was, I think, on his birthday, <laughs> and um, oh, we had lots of fun, but uh, the German lady in the motel would make us dinner and birthday cake. Oh, we had a great time. Make another comment to add to all of this, relating to the original question for me. Most of the people that were assigned to the program were people who were relatively new to the center. Aerospace was laying people off at the time, and we had the good fortune of picking up people like Leroy Frost and Ray White and some of the others. Uh, they were unknowns to the center, but they were very quality people. And as it turns out, I got the best of the best. Thanks. Thanks. Wayne, uh, there was a transition between the LLRV and the LLTV. Uh, can you describe what, uh, what it was like at Bell going from one platform to the other and what the changes were? Well, when I first arrived at Bell, the cockpit was on top of the engine, and it was a very tall vehicle and very unstable, air inlet distortion problems. And so about five months into the contract, we came up with the forward cockpit location. And uh, as I recall, about that summer of 63, and I may be off a year because I noticed in the video, Neil talked about LOR being in 1962, but I thought it was summer of 63, halfway through our design build. And anyway, Grumman, I think, got their contract for the LIM in December of 63. And by that time, we were almost ready to deliver. And, and so when it came time to get the LLTVs built, I started writing the model spec. And with Gene's help, I did most of the work. But I think as I transferred down to Dell, Bell as technical director in June, I arrived at Bell just the Monday after Joe was killed in the B-70 um, accident. But uh, basically, we used the Apollo sidearm controller, the actual Apollo hardware, and the T-handle controller for lift uh, control. Um, we removed the, the uh, circuit in the avionics to weigh the vehicle because we could predict the weight for a uh, projected accurate training uh, syllabus because we knew what we did. So there were several things that we could simplify, but we added a little larger peroxide tank so we could get a little more fuel. And uh, the wind shear was always a problem. That's the first LLTV was lost because of that. But I would say that, uh, oh, we had a slightly different orientation in the firing logic between the uh, LLTV and the LLRV, but it was in, insignificant in terms of uh, the control. Probably one of the most significant differences, the LLRV was analog, the LLTV was digital. 
Uh, yes. Just, I think, on one insignificant system, I think on the electrical system that actually uh, uh, GE, our second LLTV crash was caused by a product improvement GE sold us on their DC generator on the fan jet engine. And um, we actually had a generator failure, but the hidden defect that we didn't know about was that that new improved generator had a much longer residual magnetic field during the failure mode, and that prevented the switchover circuit from our battery bus from working. And Stu present, who had to eject with that successfully, um, he uh, was killed in the very next year in, in a T-38 accident. Houston was quite a busy place and lots of lives lost down there with astronauts and T-38s and helicopter crashes. Thank you. In those days. I have a quickie on Don's uh, <coughs> near accident, which was partially my fault. Uh, our gimbal, uh, our two gimbals for pitch and roll, uh, 90, uh, 40 degrees in each direction. Our original throttle control for the jet, uh, jet throttle was Teleflex cable. And the first few flights, we fought, fought lots of friction. And so one of, uh, Charlie Lynn in the machine shop, who built a one-third scale Mustang and flew it, he had a World War II fighter hydraulic throttle system in his bench and uh, so we slapped it on and started flying with it and we got out there on a cold morning and Don's fired up the engine and and the, the power cart is still hooked up and but he's we're ready to disconnect and let him take off well all of a sudden the, after he starts the engine comes up to 90 percent <laughs> and he has no control over it at all and the vehicle's up on its struts, spraining. And here we are still connected to the ground support equipment. So one of our me jet mechanics, Willie, he ran in. And by the way, you've got pretty good, you're down close to the pavement with the jet exhaust. But he runs in with a pair of dikes, cuts a safety wire in the main fuel control on the engine, and manually shuts the engine down. And thank goodness. Don was okay. Yeah, that, that one didn't scare me as much as the one in the air when I rolled. <laughs> <in the air. laughs> but I, I knew there were problems out there because I whacked the throttle off, cut off right away as soon as that RPM was going up and I felt it get lighter and I wasn't ready to go. And so I whacked the throttle off and nothing happened. So, I, oh, well, I got to wait. And I knew they were out there doing something <laughs> and pretty soon it quit. <laughs> Have we got one more minute for Joe Walker's problem? Flying for the 500 people out here on the yeah, back we of do. the building? Yes, go ahead. Uh, we had an AIAA, I think, demonstration with about 500 people. We didn't want to haul them down to South Base. So we pulled all the ramps down, or the, the lights uh, down off of the ramp. And we were down here a week ahead of time getting all set up. And Joe made a practice flight or two behind the buildings there. So on the real day, we, we had a, in the RV in the early days, we had this uh, in-flight weighing system with accelerometers and so forth, and so we could actually weigh the vehicle. But it had dynamic characteristics and such that you had to have the lift stick at a, at a particular uh, stroke rate. And if you didn't do it just right, it would weigh it too light. So the throttle would come back, your sink rate would go up, and you had to abort. Well, sure enough, on this flight, <laughs> at about 50 feet, Joe had to abort because the sink rate was building up too much. And, and so I got up in the cockpit right after he landed and congratulated him. And he said, change the blankety-blank switch because we'd had a big argument. The XB-5A, the Army was flight testing, a month before had had a fatal accident and it was blamed on a switch that was critical in the transition and it was behind the pilot and he hit the wrong switch and and it crashed and he died and we had 
what I thought was a similar problem, and I'd been fighting Joe all this time to get it changed so that we wouldn't have a problem with it down on the, on the console panel, and we wanted to put it up on top of the jet throttle. Well, I examined the data afterwards. Joe had made about four switch actuations within two seconds to make that transition. And it calculated out it was the it was right at the margin of human reaction, but he he didn't have to study the data. He said, "Go ahead and put switch up there on the, on that jet throttle." But that that was a uh, but the crowd didn't know any difference. They thought it was a great flight. <laughs> good, good optics. Scott, you have a question there. What was the highest altitude that the LRV or TV uh, achieved? I was going to say, Jack Kluver, uh, toward the end of the program, as we were as we were gearing down, getting ready to send to Houston, we got up to about ten thousand feet. This is on the jet engine alone, not not using the lift rockets. I, I in my STEM rock, um, my STEM lectures, I challenged some university students to help us calculate uh, Jane's memory of 10,000 feet versus some other projections of maybe 5,000 feet. Jack himself said it was o over 5,000 feet, and uh, but that's the best he could re recollect. And uh, but uh, I did some things to challenge some university students to take some of the jet engine fuel rates and other factors and come up with uh, a best guess of maybe 7,000 or something just yeah. to argue with Gene here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Memories, memories, memories. For, for the normal uh, testing and development, we very seldom went over 1,000 feet. In fact, as I recall, we like to use 800 feet as a max because we were working under the Air Force traffic, the jets that were coming, breaking overhead and going over us for landing. So and we had guaranteed the tower we were going to stay below that and not get into their traffic. And we're doing the last sim down the last 500 feet or so, so that worked uh, well for us where we were operating. Like Gene had mentioned, South Base was sort of ideal. We were sort of underneath everything and able to function like that. And when Jack took it up, I think he was just looking for sort of an altitude record. He yeah, was just yeah, going yeah, up. Yeah. He put on a heck of a show down at Houston for the astronauts when uh, he was the project manager in the Pentagon, I think, on the. Uh, one of the uh, advanced helicopters. The AH-56, okay. Lockheed's uh, rigid rotor helicopter. And uh, they gave him permission to go down and fly the LL RV at that time because we hadn't delivered the LL TVs yet. And uh, but uh, I was I was up in Niagara Falls, wasn't able to see it. But I understand he put on quite a show for the astronauts with the LL RV. Okay, we have another question. Of the original question of what was it like to fly? <laughs> well, that might take a while, but uh, I had a, a good background in uh, helicopters and a few uh, VTOLs at Langley, uh, so that gave me a pretty good basis. But uh, this machine was completely different, and with a fly by wire and a rocket attitude control systems and the computerized damping and everything, it was a brand new experience. And uh, the first thing that sort of struck me as different when you sat in it, if you look at the picture, uh, it seemed like you were just there by yourself. There wasn't much up there with you. In a <laughs> helicopter, there was a canopy bow over you and something in front of you and everything. But in the LLRV, you really got the feeling you might have been sitting out at the end of a telegraph pole and you weren't sure what was behind you coming along. But uh, there was a lot behind it, computer and the servos and everything like that. Uh, on the first liftoff, uh, I made in it, I was amazed at all the uh, noise and the recirculation and everything from the uh, engine and the rockets firing. And the attitude rockets, uh, they were spitting and firing all the time and there were little particles of uh, peroxide that were not completely decomposed and we found out real early we better get a scarf because we had flight suits on, Nomex, fire protection, we had boots on, protection but uh, helmets, but around our neck it was getting in and Joe and I were both coming back with little burn spots on our neck so we immediately got onto the silk scarf thing to protect us. Uh, 
But with that, when you lift up, you bring up the jet engine throttle, you're really coming up on a V2L mode. We didn't ever take off in a lunar simulation mode. That was for the approach and landing. But we take off in a V2L mode, and the engine was putting out max power. Some mornings, if it was warm, you'd even wait until you burn a little fuel off. I had a couple of them where I'd come up on the oleos, and I thought, well, I don't want it to fly anyway because I don't have enough positive thrust to get away from the ground where I want to be. But uh, the recirculation and all the peroxide going on, and if it was a cold morning, a lot of it was steam. Uh, I got the feeling, and I commented before, instead of flying a vehicle, I felt like I was trying to coax a big locomotive to get started somewhere, <laughs> like you see in a train station, the old steam engine is coming out the side and the wheels spinning and getting going and slowly creeping out. But as soon as you got about five to 10 feet off the ground, it was great because the sound went away, the recirculation went away, and your thrust picked up. And it was quite, quite a nice feeling. Every time I'd fly, as I come up through this sort of awkward liftoff thing to get into flight mode where I was above that, and then I had some power to climb out and fly away. So in that mode, it was when you're watch up and away, it was sort of like a helicopter because when you tipped it, it would translate and then pitched it over and go forward and back pretty responsively. And so it wasn't too much different than what I'd done before. But when you went into the lunar simulation, it was a different world. Like Neil had mentioned there, a lot of anticipation required, large angles required. And I think that encouraged the pilot not to sit and generate high rates going either direction translation or fore and aft because he knew it was going to take a while to get them stopped. So you try to keep everything within, within reason flying it and it still took the large angles and, and some time delay. Uh, it sort of took some anticipation, I guess is what you'd say, more anticipation than flying in that 1G or the Earth environment. Um, on the landing and the control, like I said, with the lift rockets and everything, that was very smooth. That was nice control and for your touchdown and, and going through it. It was quick. You didn't have a lot of time. When I talked about the switchology in a matter of a fraction of a second, uh, that was important. We couldn't put all the switches, critical switches, on the stick. We put a lot of them on there, but we had some on the side panel. And the time that I had where the thing was out of balance and I was losing control of it, I went very quickly. I knew where the switch was and I moved it. I don't know what the timing was. But when both the other attitude system came in, then I over controlled. It took me back the other way and they call that a pilot induced oscillation. So then I stopped that. And so what you do is you bring it back to where you have it stabilized and landed. So that, but anyway, it, it was a challenge to fly. I think the more you flew, the more comfortable you became in it as a different vehicle. But uh, it was different. The, uh, that weighing feature they mentioned when you went into the lunar simulation and you brought your rocket lift stick up, you brought those two 500-pound rockets online firing, that was a tedious thing for the pilot to do it exactly to get a perfect weighing. And sometimes I didn't know if it was displacement or rate or displacement or what, because sometimes you'd get it to be perfect. I'd lift up that and I look up my jet engine RPM and I'd see that drop about two and a half percent and I think I'm in business. I'm in business. That's just about what I like and I'd be going into lunar sim. And if it didn't work that way and that RPM dropped down further, I'd come out of it because I knew I didn't have enough lift rocket to complete the test mission and land it. But uh, it kept you on your toes. It's a demanding machine. Uh, the Weber seat, I mentioned before, it was, uh, it was super. And, uh, you know, when we did the early flights, Walker and I and then Jack Kluver, it was just like a company doing the experimental flights on a new machine. It had never flown before. We assembled it out here. We had to go through and prove all the uh, auto, auto throttle devices, the drag cancellation, the various control powers and things like that. And when I went down to Houston, they were operating in a little more pressure, I think, a little higher winds and things like that, and they lost them. Uh, some, uh, one, some were mechanical and some were just wind shear and things. And uh, that always bothered me, but I sure felt good about the, the Weber seat. And uh, the fact that we had it, and at one time, there was a program, a plan where we had eight 
of these lift rockets, which would give you a max of 4,000 pounds of thrust. And the idea was if the jet engine quit, we were going to time it to where we used those rockets to get us back on the ground. But I never believed my timing was ever going to be that good. <laughs> and when the decision came up to pull those off and rely on the ejection seat, if the jet engine failed, I was real happy, and I think Walker was too. I think it was a smart decision. Well, you had to guess on what the free fall was. You did before you brought them on, and then you may <laughs> be wrong. And I was glad that Kluber and I convinced Houston to take them off yeah. so that astronauts wouldn't be using them down yeah. there. Uh, yeah. and, and I think it worked out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing about Joe's getting his Navy training in the helicopter, Jack Kluber told me that before Joe ever started flying the LLRV in the early days, he took him out in a chopper over the lake bed, and Joe had never flown a helicopter. So he gave him the controls, and, and he struggled a bit, and this was on a Friday. And so uh, Jack comes in and asks Joe Vinsel, the boss, where Joe was on Monday. <laughs> and it turns out he's already down at Pensacola <laughs> in helicopter training. He had pulled strings and got out of there on the weekend yeah, when he discovered how, how he Jack got his could, attention. Yeah, yeah, got his attention. Com comment on that. I, that I don't think is unusual. Joe was such an accomplished pilot, and he had done so many programs, like on the X-15 and other uh, jets and testing. He was very confident. He hadn't been exposed too much to helicopters. I doubt very little. And uh, I think at that time, when he went out with Kluver, he had no idea that there was a little different set of equations with flying a helicopter in a VTOL mode. I had the uh, benefit of the background at Langley, so it wasn't a problem. But what really impressed me was the way Joe came along. He really was no, obvious to me he was a super pilot because he adapted to that very quickly. We flew together and a little Bell helicopter for support and proficiency. When the lunar lander wasn't flying, we'd use the Bell to fly around and do what we could proficiency-wise. And uh, Joe was, was excellent, and we would challenge each other. We'd fly, if we were flying somewhere, he'd take one leg, I'd take the next. And so when you're flying with a chief pilot and you bring in a helicopter to land, you make damn sure you make a real smooth landing, which I do. <laughs> So one day we're coming back from Fox to Edwards, and Joe was flying the leg, and we made an approach out here. Joe made his approach and everything, and he really made a nice approach, a very smooth landing. And if you knew Joe Walker, the first thing he'd do would be turn around and look over at me, like, what do you think of that? <laughs> Before he could say a word, I said, Joe, that was nice. I see you've been studying my technique. <laughs> <laughs> and his jaw dropped about that far. <laughs> but he, he was a super guy. And that, and that was a privilege to me to work with him. I said that I picked the lunar lander third. Well, I did because I was old Navy fighter pilot background. You want to go faster and faster. But I was really happy that I was assigned to that program with him because it was a challenge. He was a true professional, and I learned a lot working with him. And it was quite a joy. I've, later on, we went deer hunting together, and we'd stop and have a cool beer after a hot day of work in the desert and everything, and uh, he was a super guy. Well, the same thing with instrumentation. We, we were given uh, plans for what the displays, tape displays, uh, for major cockpit displays in the LEM were to be, and in our shops here, we built tapes to duplicate that. They weren't the exact hardware, but they did what was to be well, done. They scaled them up so they fit the longer eye right. distance, too. So uh, we were always ahead of the curve. We were, we were the pioneering for them and answering questions that they need to have answered way ahead of the time when they needed it. So the program was, was beneficial in, in myriads of ways. Well, unquestionable pioneering in VTOL reaction control. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing on the ejection seat, if I may put in, that was designed for the seat man uh, CG to be offset from the center of thrust about two and a half inches. And the theory was that in a VTOL, you sweep the 45 degree angle from whatever attitude you are, and so analytically, you, you have the very best chance of survival. And so the residual momentum after ejection 
would normally result in a two and a half tumble forward because of that residual offset. But that's why they measured it so accurately. And we tried to control the dry CG measurement on our weight and balance fixture to one tenth of an inch. And then we tried to uh, get it within a quarter of an inch for takeoff CG control and flight management for wet CG in flight was a half inch sphere trying to get it and, and we had to overcome that some of that time with the roll switch on the peroxide tanks. And we weighed the pilots regularly to make sure that weight was <laughs> maintaining within those same kind of boundaries. Oh, we put even uh, cans on the legs and would measure lead shot to accomplish the weight the and balance uh, for the different pilots. Originally, the idea was to move the payload back and forth on the back rack, and it was too much trouble. So we just put some cans on there and put a lid on it, and we'd Took measure the lead shot in, and off we'd go. <laughs> we have one more question from the floor. Would each of you please um, uh, explain what it meant personally and professionally to you to be a part, to have pioneered to work for the moon landings? Uh, Abe, one, uh, one item. Who made the first lift off on the uh, LLRB? Ray, Ray White. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good story. We didn't have the jet engine installed, and we wanted to test the rocket system, and so we didn't have our hard uh, concrete connects down there to tie it down with, so we just tied some big concrete blocks on it and figured out we had plenty. So he comes on with the uh, all eight 500-pound rockets, and uh, I don't know who made the wrong calculation. I'll take the blame for it. But anyway, he, he lifted off. <laughs> not, 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 not very far. You know, a few inches, but we, we got a kick out. That, huh? Okay, so that's when the first flight isn't exactly the first flight. There you go. Uh, my, my recollection, or my satisfaction with the role that I played, I feel really culminated when uh, Neil asked me to feed him some data on that that uh, video you just saw in uh, July of 2007. He was starting to write it. So I gave him some pictures and answered some technical questions. And then uh, Lloyd Walsh went over and, and I and, and, and saw him right after he gave that speech and gave him a big hug. But uh, but then that followed, I, I had proposed a lunar landing, go for lunar landing conference in Tempe in 2008. And that's when uh, the Dryden team showed up at that conference and resulted in a trade study that Houston authorized, paid for, I think. I participated in that, and um, it culminated, and didn't culminate, but uh, near the end was a high point where we got Neil, Gene Cernan, uh, Jack Schmidt, Harrison Jack Schmidt, and John Young. And we met down in Houston and spent a whole day telling what I would call the Youngons how we did the training in the, in the <laughs> early 60s. But um, in a lot, of, a lot of work before that and during that time and, and even after, Dave Scott and Gene Cernan and Neil all uh, extremely favorable to supporting a, a, a gimbal jet for the for the future training, and that that really made me feel good here. And that was not that many years ago, really, that we did all that because uh, uh, John Kelly led the team here on looking at. I think we had five different platforms that would be considered. And uh, during that time at Houston, Joe Tanner, who had trained half the shuttle pilots in the STA and spent a lot of time out here. I think you know Joe well. I met him uh, during this time, and he now teaches up at uh, University of Colorado, where I live. But uh, he had trained half those shuttles, but he had made five spacewalks as well and done a Hubble repair mission. But he and I still have a big argument going about uh, two-place cockpit for a future LLTV or a single cockpit. And I'll tell you, all the Apollo astronauts 
they just want one because they feel like that they got to know they can do it by themselves. And they can eject here and survive, as Gene Cernan says, and live to go on another training flight. But they can't do that on the moon. And it really gives them that self-confidence if they can uh, do it well here on the, on the Earth. And they only want to be responsible one soul. Yes. That's yes. right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of issues. And I'm proposing that Joe Tanner and I have a uh, a debate at, uh, <laughs> in Boulder in front of the CU uh, aerospace engineering people and invite some of these guys from Apollo to come and, and help me defend their position. Well, of all the, all the astronauts who flew to the moon and used the LLRV TV, I only know one that objected to having that. All the rest of them were unanimous that that was absolutely essential. Well. And I think they all, during the time that they were taking it, and I think the one exception you may be talking about is, uh, is in later years, uh, as uh, I hate to say it, but dementia set in. <laughs> so we, we have a question hanging for Dave Stoddard. <laughs> 